Since the beginning of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, countless videos and photos have been released. They made it possible to make certain observations regarding some existing or missing capabilities or just learning lessons about certain situations. At the same time, a propaganda war is taking place with statements made on both sides which are not supported by any evidence. One such statement is about a pilot who is referred to as Ghost of Kyiv. How real could this pilot be? Even Ukrainian officials admitted that a pilot with that many air victories never existed. However, it is worth speaking about the why. The capabilities of the Ukrainian air defense near Kyiv at the beginning of the conflict which also determines the basics of the limit of fighter operations over Ukraine, even after three months of the beginning of the conflict. According to the old claim, in the first two days of the war, one Ukrainian pilot achieved six aerial victories against the following airplane types. Two Su-25s, two Su-35s, one MiG-29, and finally one Su-27. The sub-variant of the Russian planes was not given, which impacts their combat capabilities. The Su-25s likely mean the Cold War era variant because only a very few later manufactured versions are available. The Cold War versions of the 9.12 and 9.13 variants of the MiG-29 literally disappeared from Russia's inventory. This plane could very likely be a MiG-29 SMT. Regarding the Su-27, the difference between Cold War, the SM and the SM-3 variants are significant with regard to its armament and cockpit. According to the Ukrainians, the pilot achieved the claim victories flying on a MiG-29. At the beginning of the war, three air brigades had in total about 70 MiG-29 fighters, 9.13 variants. Besides the MiGs, Ukraine still had Su-27 fighters, which were inherited from the Soviet Union. Two tactical air brigades have them. The video from now focuses only the MiG-29 and only at the end does it goes back to the Su-27. Because of time constraints, only the very basics and main features of the mentioned planes will be presented to get a picture about their differences and possible capabilities. The numbers of sorties flown was not mentioned, but considering the length of the air war, flying many sorties within two days was not possible. Before the attack, Ukraine possibly relocated and dispersed its planes to prevent them from being destroyed or disabled at their main air bases. This would have an effect on the sortie rate. Another factor is that at least some of the Ukrainian air surveillance radars were disabled or destroyed. There are images about at least one site where a P-14 and the P-37 radar was destroyed. With this move, the Russians potentially decreased the efficiency of the ground control interception. In some areas of the country, it is possible that the radar support was not available for a while. These strikes against the radars likely were performed with the KH-555 cruise missiles. Iskander or Tochka ballistic missiles were also possible tools. Compared to the firepower of Russia, Ukraine did not have comparable firepower to perform such strikes against Russian radars. Given that Russian forces could also use the territory of Belarus, long-range air surveillance radars could operate without danger relatively close to Kyiv at a distance of 100-150 km. In addition, the Russians have ever explained the A-50U and A-100. For them, the radar horizon is not a factor, considering the monitored airspace. They can detect targets at medium and high altitude deep inside Ukrainian airspace. The Russians essentially were able to monitor all of the airspace 100-150 km deep along the Ukrainian border from the north and northeast. Moreover, their long-range air defense systems could destroy planes flying at medium and high altitudes deep in the Ukrainian airspace nearby and above Kyiv. Such SAM systems are the S-300PM2, S-400 or the Army Air Defense S-300VM. Even the medium-range Book M3 has about 60 km effective range against maneuvering targets. These air defense systems have not yet been presented on the channel, but we can give a basic overview. The listed air defense systems can track and shoot down targets the size of a fighter jet 
at distances of up to 60-150 km, depending on the type of the target and many other factors. A radar near the Belarusian Ukrainian border can detect targets down to a minimum altitude of 500 meters near Kyiv. Targets below 500 meters are under the radar horizon. Ukraine only has Cold War era medium and long range SAMs. These are the Buk M1, S300V1, S300PS, and the S300PT air defense systems. These are able to provide area denial at some level. The Buk M1 has roughly a 30 35 km maximal engagement range against fighters. The different variants of the S300s up to 75 km. Around Kyiv, about 5 6 S300 PT and PS missile batteries deployed formed a defensive ring around the capital. They protected with overlapping engagement zones the most important areas and objectives around the city. The long range S200D Dubna systems were retired in 2014. Such conditions had to be considered by the Ukrainian pilots. If they did not approach the combat zone at a very low altitude, then detection by the Russian ground based radars were quite certain. This may have been true on both sides, but the Russians had the advantage in this area because of their AVEX planes. Ukraine had only fighters which were inherited from the Soviet Union, we will focus on the MiG-29, the 6.13 variant. The only beyond visual range capable air-to-air -air missile of the MiG is the semi-active guided R-27R. This demands tracking the target with the radar from the launch until the impact. This missile is carried only in the inner underwing hardpoints. For the 9.13 MiG-29 variant, drop tank can be carried instead of Air-27 air missiles on these hardpoints, but this means sacrificing the BVR capability. The cockpit is outdated even by early 2000s standards. Multifunction displays are not available, the HUD is very simple and provides much less information compared to the more advanced planes. Because of the lack of MFDs, movie map displays are not available. This would support the easy navigation and better situational awareness. The ladder is especially limited because of the MiG lacks the interflight data link capability with other fighters. The short range air to air missile of the MiG is the Air 23. It is essentially a late 70s infrared guided missile with frequency modulated infrared seeker. Its guidance is similar to the AIM-9 Lima Sidewinder variant. The radar of the MiG is a mechanically scanned type. Beside the radar it has an infrared search and track sensor that calls. It can detect more than one target thanks to the mechanically steered sensor. Measuring the speed, heading and distance of multiple targets with the course IRST is not possible. A laser rangefinder is part of the car system, but depending on many factors, it can only measure distances between 3-6 km and only one target at a time. The system has about 10 km detection range against incoming targets with at least a minimal flyby distance at best. From side and rear, the detection range is about 20-30 km. These values are idealized, assuming good weather and high altitude. In contrast, the claimed Damned Su-35s are far more advanced. It has so-called glass cockpit. There are very large MFDs in the cockpit. With the interflight data link and moving map function, they provide superior situational awareness compared to the old Ukrainian MiGs. The Su-35 has an AS type radar which has a larger antenna than the MiG. It is far quicker scanning radar with larger detection range. The Sukhoi also has an IRST, but it is not the technology of the late 70s, it is a more advanced device. Compared to the Su-35, the avionics of an Ukrainian MiG-29 fighter is roughly as advanced as an 80 Commodore 64 computer compared to a modern PC. The Su-35 has the R-77-1 Beyond Visual Capable Air-to-Air -air Missile, which has active guidance similarly to the AIM-120 MRAM. In the terminal phase, the missile is self-guided because it has its own radar. The launch platform does not have to track the target during the whole engagement. It provides a massive advantage over the old semi-active R-27R. 
The icing on the cake is that the Sukhoi has a missile approach warning system using multiple infrared sensors providing a 360 degree coverage. The principle of the system is detecting the infrared emission of the rocket engines burning with huge power and long flame. Based on the relative position shifting of the detected signal, it can be analyzed whether the sense source is moving towards the aircraft or not. With the help of sensors, using flare decoys automatically is possible. In contrast, on the Ukrainian MiG-29's only manual launch is available, only the pilot's eyes can detect a missile launch. This provides quite a slim chance to detect it visually and react in time. The launch has to be within the field of view of the pilot and has to be close. Why? The Su-35 in many cases can detect even beyond visual range missile launch. This means evasive maneuvers can be performed in time. For example, before an active radar guided air-to-air -air missile gets close and turn on its radar. Summarizing, with some exaggeration, the MiG is almost deaf and blind compared to the Su-35. It is quite hard to imagine that anybody downed two such Sukhoi fighters using an outdated MiG in the presented environment. Moreover, the range of the Sukhoi is far greater, which makes possible flexible mission planning and execution. Since the basic use of fighter jet is that they fly in pairs, imagining that a very lucky Ukrainian pilot shot them down one by one is in the category of fairy tales. Because of land and air-based surveillance radars and the threat of long-range SAMs, flying above 300-500 meters would be quite suicidal behavior for the Ukrainian pilots. Because of the Russian advantage in surveillance, the only real possible tactic seems to be the hit and run. The Ukrainian planes should fly low during the whole mission to avoid or delay the detection as long as possible, approach the target, launch, then disengage in escape. But flying low has a serious negative impact on aircraft's range. With full air-to-air -air armament, assuming only 30 minutes of patrol time, the combat radius would be barely above 200 km. Even at high level, the combat radius of the MiG is barely 500 km, with reserve fuel for a few minutes of air combat. If the MiG sacrifices its beyond visual range capability in order to carry underwing drop tanks, it can achieve a roughly 600 km combat radius with a 1000 km per hour sustained speed and fuel for a few minutes of air combat. With 30 minutes of slow speed patrol, the combat radius is roughly 450 km. Even flying at low altitude, as an Ukrainian jet flew closer to Kyiv, as it increased its chance of detection by a Russian AVEX plane. The A-50U or A-100 planes could alert Russian fighters in the combat zone if they had not detected the Ukrainian fighters using their own radar. Flying very low at night in terrain following style is not possible with the MiG. The pilots did not have night vision goggles, the cockpit is not compatible with such device. The MiG does not have terrain following radar. If we assume it is possible to get close to Russian planes flying at low altitude, then the tactics was likely similar to those used by Iraqi pilots against F-14s during the Iraq-Iran war. The Iraqis used a tactic called the Giraffe. The Giraffe uses a low-level target approach supported by ground-based radars without turning on the radar of the fighter. The goal is to get within the launch range of the Air-73 short-range infrared guided missiles without being detected. The 9.30 MiG variant cannot use the infrared guided Air-27 Tango variant with longer range. This means that even in case of side attack, the launch range is less than 8 km if the target does not perform any defensive maneuver. From the rear, the launch range is only 4-5 km or even shorter against a maneuvering target. For executing such an attack, the land-based radars are needed to send target coordinates and orders to the MiG-29 via a data link. The MiG has data link capability, it can receive commands from higher level command posts, but it does not work between fighters. Using such ambush tactics, Ukrainian pilots maybe could possibly down some older Russian planes. This could be the Su-27SM. This is an upgraded Cold War Su-27 with large MFD displays, it can use the Air-77 missile, but it still has mechanically scanned radar and it does not have a missile approach warning system. 
if Su-25s were not ambushed, shooting them down can be surprisingly hard. Similar to the A-10 attack plane, the Su-25 is equipped with a large number of flares. More than 200 can be loaded into the plane. Against the old Air-73, this is a lot. Once a MiG gets close to these slower attack planes, they simply cannot escape. The MiG, even without using the afterburner, can reach 1200 km per hour, it is twice as fast as an armed Su-25. The problem is the Air-73, which likely is easily fooled. Flyers employed in massive quantities would very likely deceive the seeker of the missile. During Operation Desert Storm in 1991, many AIM-96 M variant Sidewander missiles were defeated by a dozen of flares or even fewer. The Su-27 has hundreds of them. The Air-73 is very similar in guidance to these American missiles. As a last resort, using the internal gun is a possibility, but the attack would have to be executed quickly to escape before any patrolling enemy fighter could react. Such an ambush against the Su-35 seems very unlikely because it's missile approach warning system. The point of the infrared based sensor system is to prevent such ambushes. If the system works as advertised, the chance of a successful ambush is marginal based on the experiences of Desert Storm. It is also not hard to imagine that if any Russian plane had been shot down, other Russian jet would have retaliated, which were superior in number, quality and speed. However, there is no reliable information about the presence of patrolling Russian fighters. The A-50U and A-100 AVEX planes are able to track targets in ground clutter. It seems unlikely that an Ukrainian fighter jet could get close to a Russian aircraft even if it approached at low altitude. The terrain of Ukraine is mostly flat, there is very little cover and the ground clutter is not very serious. However, the capabilities of the Russian airspace control aircraft are not public. On paper, they should be able to track a targeting ground cutter from about 150-200 km. However, stop here for a moment. Because until now, we assumed that ground-based air defense did not exist, only surveillance radars. If only 5 S-300 PS and PT missile batteries were near at Kyiv, that means 30 target channels. They could attack 30 targets at a time. Their overlapping engagement zones provided 12-18 target channels in some directions and they could defend each other. In addition, there were other available air defense systems which were capable of destroying medium and high altitude targets such as the Book M1. Considering this very strong and layered ground-based air defense, imagining that the Ukrainians would send obsolete fighters is quite a ridiculous idea. One MiG-29 could attack a single target from only some kilometer distance, while only a single S-300 missile battery could engage far more than one and have a far higher chance of surviving. The reality was that both sides were forced to fly low because of the radar-guided error denial SAMs. Because of this threat, we could see countless videos of low-flying planes on both sides early in the conflict and far later even in May or June. It seems at least a part of Ukraine's S-300 systems were still operational, but they are not necessarily in every front. On the other hand, the low-altitude flying allows both sides to use shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles man pads, as well as the short-range infrared-guided systems like the Strelaten. The threat of medium and long-range radar-guided SAMs is so high that even low-level flying is more acceptable even if it leads to inevitable losses. Some evidence suggested that Russia tried to destroy or just suppress Ukrainian SAMs, at least one KH-31 missile wreckage was found in Kyiv. However, an in-depth presentation of the S-300 family would be required to elaborate on this topic, which is not the purpose of this video. The battlefield environment and the quality differences between the allegedly shot down planes provide no basis for giving much credit to this whole story. In fact, Ukraine admitted that the legendary pilot never existed. The script of the video was made long before this news. In my opinion, it was worth examining, explaining at least the basis of the air war, to understand the reasons regarding the why. 
In fact, it was weird why the whole story was based on the MiG-29, because it makes more unbelievable from a tactical point of view. If we swap the MiG-29 for the Su-27, the situation differs because it will be able to carry longer range missiles and more of them. The R-27T has about 2.5 times larger kinematic range over the R-73. If the infrared seeker is able to lock and track the target, the better kinematics can be utilized. The launch range in a side or semi-side attack can be 10 km. This is an advantage against planes without the missile approach warning system, because they can hardly detect a launch from such a distance by naked eye. Thanks to its huge internal fuel capacity, the Su-27 has larger combat radius even compared to the free drop tank equipped MiG-29, which does not have beyond visual range capability. The only area where the Su-27 is worse is rather cross section. Because of the size of the plane, Russian AVEX planes would likely detect it earlier than the MiG-29. However, this consideration do not fundamentally change the situation. The chance of success is very small, while the risk is high. It seems far more logical to use S-300 and other aerial denial SAMs instead of outdated Cold War era fighters. If you like the video, share, subscribe, ring the bell and follow the channel. You can support the channel via Patreon for exchange early access videos, voting on planned topics and extra content is accessible as well as regular updates about the projects.